Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, the listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Ali Sanjabi, AB Puppy, Dale McCahey, and Derek Chen. On this episode of DTNS, what kinds of ads are the least invasive? YouTube says it might have the answer. Plus, new child safety builds are designed to protect kids, but do they really? And Allison Sheridan is back from a big travel journey and has all the thoughts on the tech that she used. This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, September 19th, 2024. From Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. From Columbus, Ohio, I'm Rob Dunwood. And from the PodFeed Podcast, I'm Allison Sheridan. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Allison, good to have you on the show. How you, how you doing? How's the jet lag? Oh, man. Nine, nine hour difference where we were gone for 23 days. You get real used to that time zone. And it took, uh, it took a good week before I slept at all at the right time. It was, it was rough. Not going to lie. But I think I'm good now. All right. Well, we're glad to have you. We'll be talking uh, to Allison about that trip a little bit later in the show. But first, let's start with the quick hits. Nintendo and the Pokemon Company filed a lawsuit in Tokyo District Court on Wednesday against Pocket Pair. That's the creator of Pal World claiming that Pal World inv- infringes on Pokemon trademarks. Nintendo argues that Pal World has too many similarities to Pokemon, like creative, creative designs for creatures, gameplay elements. Nintendo is known for aggressively protecting its IP, and this move follows a pattern of legal action against games that resemble anything Pokemon. Pocket Pair has not yet responded to the allegations. Thursday, the European Commission began proceedings outlining how Apple must comply with the Digital Markets Act, pushing the company to open up its closed ecosystem to competitors or face potential fines. The commission stated that with iOS connectivity for devices, or I should say they started with iOS, um, for devices like smart watches, headphones, VR headsets, and things like that. The second part of the process will dig into how Apple handles interoperability requests for developers and third parties for iOS and iPad OS. The EC expects the inquiry to last about six months. Google Chrome is rolling out passkey logins designed to make it easier, or at least more secure, to sync across devices without needing a password. So as a user, you can now log in with a PIN or use biometric data, such as a fingerprint or a scan of your face. A U.S. Federal Trade Commission report states that major social media platforms like Meta, TikTok, YouTube, Twitch, and others collect and share vast amounts of user data with little transparency, including its use in AI systems. Although its findings were anonymized and did not reveal specific companies' practices, the FTC highlighted how these companies use tracking technologies and buy data from brokers, benefiting financially but at the expense of user privacy. FTC Chair Lena Khan, or should say, yeah, Lena Khan, uh, warned that these practices can lead to serious risk, such as identity and stalking. Brazil's Supreme Court has ordered X to stop circumventing a court-ordered suspension or face a daily fine of 5 million reals, which is around U.S. Uh, $921,000. So despite the suspension, many users in Brazil got access to the platform back after a network update on Wednesday. That triggered the fine. X says this was an inadvertent technical issue due to a network switch. It was not trying to circumvent the ban. It is attempting to resolve the situation with Brazilian authorities. Meanwhile, Brazil's telecommunications agency is stepping up efforts to block X through services, uh, third-party services, rather, uh, like Cloudflare. YouTube has decided to widely roll out, or more widely anyway, its new pause ads feature. This is said to give users the option to pause video playback and view an ad, but it's really about serving an ad to anybody who pauses video, whether they like it or not. Uh, You can look at it two, uh, two different ways. This is how it works. Call it a new approach to monetizing video. That's definitely what it is. Letting advertisers get your attention without necessarily disrupting the viewing experience with something like a mid-roll ad or something that's in a lower third of a screen. After an initial test, the less interruptive experience, as YouTube calls it, is now 
going to reach more users. It's unclear if a viewer would see fewer unskippable ads or ads in general because of this going forward, because this is on top of the ads that we already see, right, Rob? So yeah, I actually had the opportunity to see this when they were testing it out last year. So you're watching something on YouTube, you hit the pause button on your remote or your, you know, on your you know, device that you're watching YouTube on. And then you get up and go do whatever you're going to do. And ads will continue to play. Or I should say they will start playing when you hit that pause button. So the thing for me is that it's it's not really intrusive because it was at a the ads were happening at a time when I wasn't really paying attention. But I did notice that you would hit them, you would hit the mute button so that you wouldn't have to listen to the ads if you truly weren't paying attention to them. So that was that was going to be my question, Rob. It, I I like the creativity of this idea. I think it's, a, you know, just hating on everything isn't any fun. Let's see what's good about it. That would be great, except most of the reason I pause is because I want to listen to somebody tell me something. So if I hit pause and then it starts audio playing in, a, in an ad, is that really what happens? Yeah, that, 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 that was okay. my experience. That okay, no, I'm out. I'm out. Nope, nope, no, 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 no. <laughs> I hit pause. My thing shouldn't make any noise. Um, for, like I said, well, but this, you're this pausing the ago. content that you were watching. So today I was, uh, I had been playing daily tech news show on my iPad as I do every morning because I never miss a show. And I flipped over and I was doing something else. And all of a sudden Sarah Lane was bellowing out the tech news at me. My, my podcatcher on my iPad started playing you anyway, even though it wasn't even in the foreground. So I think that's an iOS bug, but it'd be that kind of thing, you know, <laughs> yes. where you paused yeah. it. I think that's something different. Yeah. You know, no, I, I don't know. I, when I, when I think of, so, so I am a weird person who watches a fair amount of YouTube stuff, but I don't pay for YouTube premium. So I, I just deal with the fact of life that there are ads um, ads will, you know, interrupt whatever I'm watching. A lot of the stuff that I'm watching is pretty short form anyway. So I just, it's not the end of the world. Um, but let's say that I, you know, I wanted a, a less interrupted experience, you know, pausing video, going up, going to the bathroom, you know, yeah. Getting something to a little snack, whatever, coming back, um, and missing those ads that are playing feels like just commercial breaks from the days <laughs> yeah. of yesteryear. Yeah. That's what it feels like to me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I don't think you're weird, Sarah. That's you've made a trade off. Some people pay to not see ads and some people pay with their eyeballs. That's fine. That's the deal we've made. Right. We've agreed to that deal. Yeah. Um, I still have a problem with it making noise. So I, I really do wonder how advertisers are going to pay for this, because if I were advertising, I wouldn't want to spend as much on an ad that happens during the pause. Because like I said, for, for me, this, the, the one time that I experienced this last year during the test was the person's house. I was over, they hit the pause button, hit mute, hit the mute button. And then, you know, we just kind of went on about what we were doing, came back, hit the mute button, hit the pause button, the ad stopped and the, the video started playing again and never really even paid attention. So from a consumer standpoint, I'm not terribly bothered by that because it wasn't at a time I was paying attention to what was happening on YouTube anyway. I do concede your point, Allison, that if you're pausing because you don't want the audio to play, that could be problematic. And if you don't, you know, if you if you can't get to your mute button quickly, that that could be potentially uh, irritating. Yeah. But as a, as an advertiser, I don't know that I would want to pay as much for those ads as I do the ones where the person literally is sitting there having to watch the ad. So I think that they could do two tier. I don't know that muting can actually work because a lot of times I mute when I'm sitting right there. I just want, I don't want to listen to it. If it's, you know, five seconds, okay, I'm going to go five, four, three, two. Okay, play. I'll listen to it then. But if it's a little bit longer, if it's in the middle, I'm irritated enough, I'll probably hit mute. But I could see easily doing, okay, if it's a pause commercial, maybe it's 60% of the cost of a, of a full playing one. Yeah, that that's one of my other questions is like, OK, so, you know, everyone is sort of like, oh, it's so easy to ignore ads or get around ads or, it, you know, it, it's all about, you know, dodging ads as much as possible or just suffering through them. If you are an advertiser, you are trying to reach somebody. You're not trying to annoy them. You you know, if if if, uh, you know, if there's some sort of mid roll ad for. I don't know, you know, ABC insur insurance company that everybody just hates. It's like, 
that company is going to rethink the entire thing. You know, they they're in business for a reason. You know, th this whole thing, this whole structure runs off of advertisement. So right, it's like right. they ha they have to make money or the, it, it all it falls exist. apart. Right. Yeah, exactly. So now let's be fair. When The only ones I don't ever pause, look away and mute is I'm going to watch every Ryan Reynolds ad for T-Mobile because he's going to be funny. I, it, <laughs> let's just be fair. Those you play, right? Everything else you might mute and pause. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think I think this is I think it's smart. I think it's smart for YouTube to to try other stuff out. Again, you know, like Rob said, it's 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 not replacing the annoying mid roll. Oh, now my video is paused type thing. It's you are as a consumer somewhat more in the driver's seat. I think you know yeah. you pause something, you get some ads, you might see them, you might ignore them, but you know they they feel a little bit more seamless. Yeah, from the from the advertiser standpoint, if if they know that you need to see something a number of times before it even resonates with you, this is another opportunity, potentially less expensive way for them to get those ads in front of eyeballs that they nor ordinarily wouldn't get in front of. Um, just uh, just uh, on the note of pausing ads, uh, YouTube started this pilot uh, back in 2023. Hulu, AT&T also have been selling pause ads so this is not new sling tv introduced pause ads back in july but it lets users turn them off in the settings menu if it's just not working for them and um just in the in the conversation of ads amazon launched a new ai powered video generator for advertisers at its accelerate conference on thursday that turns a product image into a video of that product after some time spent processing uh, video generator currently in beta uh, for s only some select us advertisers uh, hopefully going to be fine-tuned at least amazon hopes so over time for a wider release so yes uh the uh the reimagining of ads continues <laughs> really really quick correction jpeg jpeg 84 corrected me it's mint mobile not t-mobile boy i'm really just looking at him i'm not listening <laughs> you. you know you know when you <laughs> said ryan reynolds i was like he works for t-mobile too huh, huh. i i hear the men ads on my I'm podcast just looking at him yeah i'm not even listening <laughs> so let's change gears a little bit and talk about some some new laws that are coming into place the the house energy and commerce committee has approved two significant child safety bills the kids online safety act or cosa and the children and teens online privacy protection act or copa 2 which could reshape major segments of the internet these bills were passed by a voice vote, even amid objections to certain 11th hour modifications made to COSA, specifically intended to address ongoing criticism. Both bills will give the government more regulatory power over tech companies with users under 18, with COSA imposing a duty of care on major social media companies, making them potentially liable for harm to underage users. Although the bills are related, they target different things. COSA is broadly focused on child safety and well-being, while COPA 2.0 focuses focuses primarily on the data privacy and consent. So my question for you folks, uh, Allison, are these bills, are they doing enough pr to protect children or are they potentially going too far? You know, it's getting so hard to tell. How many times have they had a bill called COPA, had a, a bill or COPA? COPA, it's two Ps. Or, yeah, and I know. Cosa. I, I've never gotten that right either. And it's really hard not to descend into, can our government do anything? Can they pass anything? Can they agree on anything? The first thing I did was go out and look and see whether uh, the Electronic F Frontier Foundation had weighed in on this one yet, and they have not that I could find as of this morning. So I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not even convinced about some of the kinds of harm they talk about with, with children. So is it far, too far, far enough? I really don't know. Not going to make a call. There, the, I was reading, um, I think it was in the Wall Street Journal, there was a story about an influencer, you know, TikTok, Instagram, you know, type influencer, a, a woman um, who was um, doing sort of like pro bean thin type thing, mm. you know, and it was like, oh, oh, no, you can't do that. You can't do that because young people are going to, you know, th that get it gets into like eating disorder territory type thing. And uh, the the article itself was was just sort of laying out the fact that you can you can be, I don't know, peddling, promoting, whatever the word is, something that is working for you online, and it is going to negatively affect somebody. When you talk about kids, 
that's where it gets tricky, right? Real tricky. Yeah. yeah. Because because then it's like, well, you know, you know, you're, you know, if if you're sort of not fully baked as your own human, then this sort of thing might might sway you that much more this way or the next way. And I get that. At the same time, I think I think we're all pretty unique snowflakes. And <laughs> And I just, it's broad you know, based. It's hard. yeah, some, yeah. some of the sweeping laws, it, I, I actually think, I mean, protecting children, I don't have any of my own, but uh, you know, I'm all for it for sure. At the same time, I, I think, gosh, you know, this is going to help somebody and maybe hinder somebody else. It's interesting. You would bring up that example, that exact example, because you remember when Frances Haugen, uh, spoke before co- Congress, she was the, the woman that worked for Meta working on oh, the their whistleblower, ethics yes. thing. Right. Mm-hmm. One of the things she showed was that they had created an ad to target teenage girls to go to pro anorexia websites. So that very, which I consider that attempted murder, actually. Uh, but I think that's where this kind of thing comes from. And and if it, if these acts could stop that, I, I I vote thumbs up. But I don't know. I don't know enough about them to be able to say, do they actually do anything? So I think the studies are showing because the the social media companies are actually doing it themselves and admitting to that there may be a problem with social media. <laughs> And how children feel about themselves and others when they watch various forms of social media. So I think that given that these companies are deciding that, yeah, this could be an issue. We need to do something about it. The government is doing what the government does. And, and they're coming in in some, in some ways a dollar short and a day late. I do believe, however, that the, the way that the sentiment is now is that people understand that social media can be harmful to young folks. And it looks like we're starting to treat these things like car seats and cigarettes and vape pens and stuff like that, is that they're going to get regulated. My question really is, is the government doing enough? Is the government doing too much? One of the questions, one of the reasons nobody is really happy with this is because they added things in. They took a couple things out um, right in the 11th hour. And the way this looks is that depending on who's in office gets to determine what potentially could be censored. So it kind of reminds me of almost like what you have to go through with um, net neutrality, depending on who's in office, they determine whether or not net neutrality is a good thing or not. It's like, you know, depending on who's in office, they might determine that this political speech is is bad for children or talking about abortion is good for children or bad for children. You know, you, you don't know. It, it depends on where you lean politically. And that makes this an entirely gray area that I don't know that this is going to address the issue. And I'm just wondering, it's like, well, at least they're doing something because we do know this does adversely affect children. Um, I don't think there's any, any really any question about that. No. And, and the comparison to something like, you know, seatbelts, like if you get into a bad accident and you're not wearing a seatbelt, it's curtains. We all know this, wear your seatbelt. You know, if you smoke cigarettes, okay, well, some people are going to get lung cancer, you know, first, but you know, that's where you're headed. Um, on social media, you have, you know, it's a very choose your own adventure type thing. <laughs> you you can have a really fun time on social media at any age. You can also have an experience where, yeah, you feel crappy about yourself. You feel like you're not, you know, you know as cool as the next person. You know, they're, you know, somebody's uh, giving you advice that's not good, kind of thing. But it, but it isn't. It isn't a one size fits all type thing for anybody at any age. I always say this about the internet. It is the most wonderful place filled with horrible things. Yeah. <laughs> indeed, <laughs> indeed. Um, well, we'll obviously be, we, we'll, we'll be covering um, uh, how uh, the bills are received and, and obviously a, a lot of researchers will be, will be following that closely as well. So uh, we'll pass, we'll pass uh, what we know along to you. But if you have a thought about this, uh, and you probably do, or anything that we talk about on our show, our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We would love to hear from you. Keep the feedback coming. So Allison, you, you just got back from a 23 day trip to Southern African. And I know you were having a blast because I was on those emails and getting them darn near every day. 
Um, you've got, a, there's a lot that you did when you were there. So can you tell us about, you know, the, some of the stuff you used to plot your itinerary, you know, what you brought along with you and how it all went? Can you, can you just, you know, just kind of let us know what you were doing there tech wise while you were enjoying your best life? Yeah, so I'm I'm no Chris Christensen, I, you know, so I don't want to take any anything from him there. But I have a couple of things that I do that that I thought I could pick and choose out that uh, maybe people wouldn't think about. The first thing I do when I'm planning a big trip like this, or once we've committed to a big trip like this, is I create a diagram. And I use a, a free tool called Diagrams.net. Um, it's very confusing. It's a web interface. It's free. Uh, but you can, it also has uh, downloadable versions of it for your Mac or PC. And uh, what I do is I, I create this diagram that shows every single flight, every single, what time we leave places, uh, where we're landing, the names of the airports, the airport codes. I've got uh, different colored blocks for the hotels that we stay in, what days we're staying there, days and day number. Because a lot of times the itinerary is this giant written thing that says day seven and eight, we're going to go to to uh, the Kruger National Park. And you're like, well, which days are day seven and day eight? Well, that's August 3rd and 4th. And so I have coordinate transformations of all that. I've got little tiny uh, graphics in there that show here's when we were on a bus and here, here's when we we're on a plane. And it looks like a lot of work and it definitely is a lot of work. But I really recommend doing this for complex trips to get you get situational awareness of where am I going and where are these kind like I didn't even know where the countries were because I'm terrible at this. So I, I get that situational awareness, but I have actually found mistakes before in the itinerary. We were going to uh, we went to the Galapagos and Quito, Ecuador, and then down to um, Peru and went to Machu Picchu and a, a couple of different cities in there. And after I made my diagram, I looked and there were two pl places where there should have been flights, but there weren't any flights listed. And I asked the travel agent, I said, where's the flights from like, I don't know, it was Cusco to, to Lima. And she says, oh, you're supposed to book those. I was like, really? When were you going to tell me, sweetie, when I was standing on the tarmac? When was I going to find that out? And 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 I said, also, no, you're going to book that because I don't know how to book a flight in, in Lima. So uh, anyway, it's helped me with that. But the other thing is when you're going in and out of a lot of countries, you always get asked by, by immigration, where are you going? Where are you staying and for how long? And I just hold up the diagram. I hand it to them and they go, D -d 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 -d. OK, got it. And let me through. I don't have to try to remember, well, I'm staying at the Karanga site of blah. You know, don't have to know any of that. So anyway, it's a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun. And it, it also helps my family know where we are when we're on the trips. So any questions on that piece? Are you nuts? Are you an engineer? I'm just, thinking, <laughs> I'm just thinking you are such an engineer uh, that you have created a, we used to call those visios back in the day, but you know, that, yeah, that, yeah. Is, that, that was a heck of a diagram that you had right there. Yeah, it, it really, really helps. Um, one of the tech things that we brought with us that was a, a big hit that I hadn't really thought about was you're, you're out on safari and you want to see animals. Now, in some cases, these animals were really, really close up not and like a little uncomfortably close up. I remember being close to African buffalo where the guy was telling us, he says, you know, the big like the elephants, they'll give you a warning if they're going to charge and then they'll give you a second warning and then they charge or like a lion. They'll let you know twice whether they're coming. But, you know, the African buffalo don't do that. They just charge. And right then I'm looking and there's this guy, I mean, he's staring at us like death and he's really close. And so you didn't really need uh, any assistance from that. But in addition to bringing my big girl camera with a big long lens on it and everything, um, Steve brought with him a pair of binoculars. They're called the Fujifilm Techno Stabi Image Stabilization Binoculars. So they're, they're uh, um, 12 by 28. Uh, power and uh, they're image stabilized. So they have a battery in them and you turn on the stabilization and everyone on the trip had binoculars. Every pair of people had binoculars and then we would hand them ours and they'd go, oh my gosh. I mean, image stabilization is phenomenal when you're talking about that power. So uh, they're not cheap. They're 750 bucks, but they were, you know, a good pair of binoculars is going to cost you a grip anyway, but these are, are just phenomenal. We were really happy with them. And our buddy Ron had bought them because Steve had recommended them and he was also on the trip and every single day he thanked steve for the recommendation because they were that good that's amazing yeah all right all right made so, a big difference so okay so let's 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 talk about uh what you did once you were there you're taking all this footage um you're you know you're you're making memories you know how do you how do you make sure that you're you're safe with all that and you can get home with it later 
Yeah, so um, this whole idea stemmed from uh, the trip to Peru that I was talking about. But what we d- one of the things I think about is you're on a trip like this, most people just had their phones with them. That's all they had. Maybe they had an iPad too, but they had a phone and they didn't have anything else. They didn't even carry computers. We, of course, carried iPads and two computers and blah and all that. But uh, we were taking video with uh, Steve's uh, big boy camcorder and I had my big girl camera and we were, we were big girl camera. And we were taking all these pictures and video. And uh, so what we would do every night is we would back them up to, to our computers and then back them up from there to an SSD. But here's the real big trick uh, of what we did was we swap the SSD every day. So I was always carrying his backup drive and he was always carrying my backup drive. And I got this idea when we went to the Galapagos and Machu Picchu, the last day before we, we got on the, on the last plane, we switched backup drives and I was carrying Steve's, he was carrying mine and his backpack got stolen. He lost his laptop, his camcorder, his GoPro, his passport, which is a whole nother story. But he did not lose the photos and videos, memories of a lifetime because I was carrying the backup. So you can do this idea, too, even if you're not using a big girl camera, a big boy uh, camcorder, you can plug an SSD into an Android phone or into a, an iPhone and just back them up. Like with on the iPhone now, you can see the files app and you can say, take these photos, export them and put them on this SI, SSD <laughs> and just hand it to somebody else. I, I love I love you and uh, and Steve being like, all right, it's swap day. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, you know, like I did this, give it to me. You got mine. Okay. We're good. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And it reminds the other person to do the backup. I tend to be the one who remembers, but I would hand Steve, I'd say, Steve, give me my backup drive. You go, Oh yeah. Give me yours. You know, let me get mine back and swap yeah. it back and forth. That's smart. Um, yeah. It really, really made a difference. Um, that's actually a really good idea, Allison, because if you are, you know, w- with the cameras, because I would imagine that where you are, you may not have the best cell service. So you're taking pictures and you just think when you're here, they just upload to the cloud and you're good. Exactly. There, that, may exactly. Not, that may not be the case. So you might want to get those off of your device just to make sure you have them. Yeah, we had a we had a fair amount of internet on this trip, but there was one place we were in a place called Moremi Crossing, uh, which is at the Okavanga Delta. And for three days, we had zero internet. They actually turned the internet off. They have Wi-Fi at the hotel. They turn it off because they want you to get into it. And so we had zero internet for those three days. And uh, that's when I got the idea of, well, wait a minute, I was backing up my big girl camera photos, but now what about my phone photos? And that's when I got the idea to go ahead and export those and bring them onto that SSD. Uh, but yeah, it, you can't count on on even cell service in a trip like this because, you know, we are in some pretty crazy places, but uh, Zimbabwe has no uh, no cell service that we could get working on any eSIM that we got. Hmm. So uh, anyway, those are those are probably my biggest you know, top tips. But I have a, the, you guys have a link to the article that I wrote all the different tech on travel stuff that we did. Indeed. And uh, in GDI, we can we can continue this conversation if anybody in our chat has has some thoughts for Ellison. Well, she's here because um, I've got more. <laughs> <laughs> she's got more. Exactly. Exactly. But uh, Allison, thank you so much. Um, not only for making me extremely jealous of your really fun trip. Uh, now I need to go on a safari. You do. So um, that's that's my next order of business uh, after we finish the show today. But um, but but for being with us um, and and welcome home. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I feel home coming back to you guys. This well, well, we feel that way as well. Um, over in the mailbag, Mike from I Thought Texas Was a Desert. Why is it so humid here in Austin? Uh, writes, I heard a silly joke today. Feel free to use it next time there's news about Apple not working on an Apple car after all. Mike says, if Apple were to build a car, what would it be missing? Mike says, my guess was a release date this decade, but the answer is actually Windows. Uh, Oh, he made a fun. I know, I know. Grown city, grown city, Mike. You knew what you were doing. Uh, Mike says, of course, my snarky retort was, "Um, actually, MacBooks are some of the best machines to run Windows on. So you could have Windows on your Mac car. You would just need to install them yourself, and they might void the warranty. (laughs) <laughs> and it'd have to be Windows on ARM now. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it gets complicated. Um, but yes, Mike, uh, we hear you. Thank you for the dad joke. And um, yes, keep your feedback coming. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. So thanks to Mike and thanks to you, Allison Sheridan. Um, why don't you tell us where folks can reach out and find you? 
Well, like I like to say, everything good starts with podfeet.com. Um, you can find everything there. But I, we also have a link in the show notes to my travelogue. I took that uh, daily email that Rob was talking about. Every single day I sent out a, uh, a travelogue with everything we did that day with all the photos, and it makes for a great memory for us. But more than 100 people actually subscribe to this newsletter. It's kind of funny. Uh, but That's I put awesome. the whole thing into one PDF that you can download, and you can look at it and go, I need to go there. I need to go there. I need to go there. I want to see that. I want to see that. It's really fun. Well, uh, definitely do check that out, and we will have that in our show notes. Um, but patrons, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet, because Substack is trying real hard to expand out of newsletter land. They're not getting rid of newsletters. They're just talking about doing some other stuff. We'll talk about what we think is going to work and what might not. You can also catch the show live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com forward slash live. We'll be back tomorrow with Kevin Pereira and Lynn Peralta. Talk to you then. The DTNS family of podcasts. Helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>